Hi and welcome back to the breadboard. This is the second video of two um, reviewing the Perfectron PR335A industrial PC. In the first video we looked at the hardware, uh, opened up the covers, had a look inside uh, and examined all of its capabilities from a hardware perspective including temperature, environmental, etc. In this video we're going to fire up uh, Windows 7, one of the preferred operating systems for it, and uh, have a look at the I.O. and things like that. Now I don't have applications to test this out yet, uh, but we will have a look at the uh, installed hardware from a Windows 7 perspective, and if we get time we'll also look at having a Linux distribution installed. But first up anyway is the Windows 7. I've already got it installed, I don't need to to bore you all with uh, running a setup for that. I did not have to provide any CDs or anything to get this installed. I just put in from a standard Windows 7 Ultimate Edition uh, CD, professional or standard edition would work just fine too. And all the drivers for all of the hardware were just simply pulled down from the normal automatic updates. So anyway, without further ado, let's now get into it and have a look at the software. Now the version I have does not have any um, Wi-Fi built in, so I'm just connecting up um, hardwired Ethernet to it right now. Once I put it out with my CNC, I will use a um, USB Wi-Fi adapter. Um, I'm also plugging in a Bluetooth adapter so that I can use my Bluetooth keyboard and a little 2.4 gigahertz um, Logitech wireless mouse adapter. Um, that's pretty much all I'm going to plug in here right now. Uh, I will be doing some other videos to test out the RS-485 and things like that as I go through with the industrial PC stuff. So once I've got this configured before I put it outside, I will be doing some videos on some of the PLCs and displays that I have which will use Modbus and things and I will see if we can configure this to actually talk to them over the RS-485 and Modbus. Should be kind of interesting. Anyway, um, right now I'm just going to power this up. There's really not much to look at looking in here. So I'm just going to switch the camera to look at my uh, PC screen and go into the um, BIOS configuration initially and then we'll let it boot up into Windows 7 and have a look at Device Manager and then call it quits for now until we do the industrial control applications. Now obviously because this is uh, going into the BIOS settings, I can't uh, screen grab this with remote desktop or anything like that, but once I get to looking at the actual OS, uh, Windows 7, I will um, use screen grab software to improve the quality of it. And then after that we'll look at um, maybe putting in a um, Linux distribution of some kind. Okay, so powering this up now. Now the first two setups it has there are for um, too slow are for the network boot. There's two network adapters and it will try on each one of them to go out onto the network to boot up. I want to go into the BIOS settings which is right here now. Uh, let me turn off some of the other lights maybe it will help improve the uh, brightness of the display for you. All right, so what we have in here, uh, I can't, of course I can't use my mouse, is we have, this is the main BIOS, so you can see here it's an, Amer an Amy BIOS, American Megatrends BIOS, um, UEFI, so it's a fairly advanced one, and it's a 64-bit project version. Uh, Ivy Bridge i7-361 mobile processor currently running at 2.3 uh, gigahertz. It's got four cores, eight threads, so it's got lots and lots of horsepower. It's got four gigs of RAM installed running at uh, 133, so 1 1.3 gigahertz. Set for English, got date and time, administrator level, advanced settings, um, power management, you've got hibernation enabled, sleep legacy resources are disabled, S3 video repost I've disabled, uh, CPU configuration, I've just left that to be automatic um, defaults as far as I can tell. So we have um, 
a lot of different options to be configuring here. These are really just standard that anybody that's been using uh, and configuring their own motherboards will be pretty familiar with. SATA configuration. Now there is SATA 2 and SATA 3 ports on here. So I've set it up for AHCI for the hard drive that I have. Um, you can go into a SATA test mode. Um, support smart SATA controller. Speed is set for generation 3, but if you've got some older SATA devices, you can crank that back for earlier ones. Software features, RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10, RAID 5. A whole boat boatload of different uh, options for configuring the um, SATA devices. Now I've got one drive in here and you know there's limited space inside the case so you're unlikely to go beyond two so you may use RAID 0 just for mirroring but that would be probably about it. Um, in an industrial environment where reliability is key you're unlikely to stripe them where any one drive could bring down the system so uh, you know you're really limited there as far as which options you pick in this particular configuration with this motherboard. Uh, it's identifying my hard drive, um, hot plug is disabled, SATA port 1 is unknown because there's nothing else in, SATA port 2 and 3 also and uh, port 4 and 5. So the chipset has got up to looks like 6 SATA ports but there's only um, 4 sockets that I can see on the motherboard so um, you know, just because the chipset's got it doesn't mean you have to bring them all out, of course. Um, thermal configuration, all right, so for monitoring and reporting, a whole bunch of different options here. I'm not going to go into all of these right now. Super I.O. configuration, as you can see here, all six serial ports and the parallel port. Parallel port is probably, or should be probably disabled because it's not being brought out. Um, and one of these ports, I'm not sure which one is the one that's not connected. Hardware monitor, right? So 5 volts plus or minus 5 volts plus 12 volts plus 3.3, 3.3, 3.2, uh, plus 0.9 volts, probably for the V core. No fans are attached, so obviously they're not doing any monitoring there. The CPU is running at 40. The other temperature probes on the motherboard are running at 37, 35, respectively. USB configuration, legacy USB support is enabled. Um, this is all default configurations and it's currently detecting one keyboard, two mice, and two hubs, although I'm not sure what the second mouse is because I don't have one connected. One of the things, uh, CPU, sorry, serial port console redirection allows you to configure one of the ports for um, remote management if you want to. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to show you is the in the Super IO configuration is that these serial ports can be, there we go, so serial port 1 for instance is currently configured for RS485 and you can configure it for 232, 422 and 485. It's all under BIOS control so uh, kind of handy there. Serial port 2 is um, just standard, maybe there's jumpers for changing that but certainly you can change its um, address but not its basic settings. Serial port 3 the same Port 4, same, port 5. Port 5 is another one that you can configure between 232, 422, and 485. 6 is the same, so that's three ports there. And parallel port, of course, is disabled. So you've got three ports that allow you to be RS-232 or RS-485. So one of those, is, which is probably port 6, is not connected to anything. Um, chipset I.O. configuration, of course, again, fairly standard stuff. It's a um, QM77 chipset, so Wake on LAN is enabled. I haven't tried that yet, but it's enabled, which would be very handy if I wanted to power it up outside without having to go out there in the cold. Standard boot up, you can select the device for boot priority. One of the things I found when I was trying to get this to boot off of a USB key is that... Um, you need to come in here when the USB key is plugged in and tell it which one to boot from. And then uh, it treats different US key, USB keys differently as well. So if you have, say, a Kingston uh, and a SanDisk, you can't just have a generic boot from USB. You have to select which one it is. And if you think about that, that's a fairly good security feature too um, because it prevents somebody coming in with just any old random USB key and trying to boot from it and have a look what's in the system if it's a secure system. 
network boot options, quiet boot, fast boot for speeding up the boot times. Um, security, you can put in admin passwords, user passwords, etc. And the usual save and exit. So I'm not going to go into any more detail on a BIOS than what I've just done. In fact, you know, even that is probably longer than most people would really care about. Um, so I'm just going to um, so I'll save changes and exit and now let it boot up into Windows. Once it's booted up, I'll actually remote take over the screen so that I can show you things there with a better quality screen. Hi, now I've got the remote takeover working to the Perfectron Industrial PC. And as you can see, this is a classic Windows 7 uh, desktop that we're looking at. And one of the really annoying things right now is it's trying like crazy to persuade me to upgrade it to Windows 10, which of course I don't want to do because uh, I have some software that I want to run on here that will not run on Windows 10 right now because of compatibility issues that have not been fixed with drivers and everything. Anyway, um, I just wanted to go into Control Panel Device Manager and show you um, what Microsoft uh, Windows 7 has detected for all the hardware and everything. Uh, so if I go into Device Manager, I saved you the boredom of watching me install Windows 7, so apologies if people wanted to see that, but I didn't think they would. Here is the um, standard device manager list. As you can see, I have not, you know, I did not get a CD with the um, PC to have any drivers on it, and all I did was put Windows 7 Ultimate onto a USB key. Uh, put it into the front of the unit after obviously I had to add my own hard drive inside because it didn't come with a hard drive um, and I just booted it up onto the USB key installed Windows Ultimate gave it a CD uh, gave it a key so that I can use this for longer than just 180 days and I had it with a network connection and everything just got loaded up and installed uh, without really any prompting. I think the only thing I had to load manually was the USB um, host driver, USB 3 host driver. And that's the standard thing with Windows 7. Windows 8 and Windows 10, of course, they don't have those issues, but Windows 7, you needed to load those manually. But everything else for the COM ports, etc., etc., all loaded in without an issue, uh, the network ports, etc. So let's just run down and see what we've got here. Okay, the, um, the computer is an ACPI, Advanced uh, Power Management, x84 based PC. As you can see, it sees my Toshiba um, 2.5 inch drive. This is actually from a MacBook Pro when I upgraded the hard drive to a hybrid drive a little while back. This is what I pulled out of it, so it didn't have much use. Um, it's not really meant for an industrial uh, purpose, so I will put it out with my CNC that's going to be getting subjected to about minus 20 degrees C in the next few weeks. I can't really drive anything much beyond that. It just depends on what the weather does. But being in Canada, uh, we do get plenty of cold weather, so that we can test some of its extreme weather handling capabilities. Uh, display adapter, it has the um, Intel HD Graphics 4000 built in to the processor, which is fine. The LB clone drive SCSI CD-ROM is just a piece of software I added myself. Um, Windows 7 doesn't really like to handle ISO files very easily, and I had a few that I wanted to be using with this. So I just, you know, a virtual clone drive is free from slice off, so I nearly always add it to my uh, builds when I install things. HMI interfaces, the um, whole bunch of these. I've always been disappointed with Microsoft with HMI because they don't really tell you what that device is. They just tell you it's a, a HID compliant device. Well, whoop-de-woo. What HID device, compliant device? Keyboard, mouse, what? I don't know. Anyway, um, controllers, you've got your standard chipset controller. For, and I've, as I said in the previous video, I had configured it for AHCI. And uh, it's an ATA channel zero on the adapters. I've got one keyboard. And I got this really weird thing where it thinks I have two mice. I don't know why, but that's something I've seen Windows do a few times when, you know, even if you've got one device, sometimes it will pick up on the fact you've got two. Uh, here's where the interesting bit comes in. When I expand the monitors, um, right now I only have one screen plugged in, but it's always um, identifying the 
digital flat panel and I haven't found a way yet to turn that off and sometimes it can be a little annoying when the PC powers up and it decides that it wants to use the digital flat panel as the default display and leave the one that's plugged in um, blank. So uh, I've now gone into Windows and set it up as um, the HDMI screen as the default screen. And within here, I can go in and just simply disable it now that I'm uh, here. And that will prevent it from being used in the future for this particular build. Uh, network adapters, it you know, found the two network adapters. Now, they're not both the same network adapters. They are close. They're both Intel and they're both gigabit network adapters. But one's an 82574 uh, and one's an 82579LM. So I haven't looked up what the differences are, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, both of them were found and got installed quite happily. And they're both gigabit, so you can run a fault-tolerant network or even have um, the industrial PC participating in two separate networks. You might use one for communicating out to the internet or to your corporate network. Um, or your factory network and maybe the other one might be used for communicating with locally attached um, network Modbus devices or something like that. Who knows? Anyway, we'll be playing with those over the coming weeks as I start adding devices to this and using it as the main PC to talk to some of my other industrial control devices. COM ports, this is the in really interesting one. So it picked up all six COM ports. Now it doesn't see these as um, whether they're RS-232, 422, or 485. From this end of the um, software, it really doesn't know the difference because those three standards, RS-232, 485, and 422, they're all about the physical um, communications between the two communicating devices. They're not about the higher level protocol that would be sitting, you know, they're, they're, they're all going to be using eight bits, no parity, one stop bit and things like that, or with parity or, you know, and the different board rates. And things like Modbus, et cetera, et cetera, they all rely on the protocol that sits on top of that um, for communication. So as long as both ends are configured the same way, it, 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 the uh, PC is not really going to care from its software perspective. It's not going to know that it's talking over RS-232 versus RS-485 or something. But obviously at the physical level, um, there are huge differences between them. The RS-232 is just a uh, single-ended plus and minus 12 volts uh, or, you know, to 15 between. Uh, it depends on what you're hooking into, but it's just a single-ended transmit and receive drive system. RS-422 is a differential um, signaling and then RS-485 is a little more advanced um, than even RS-422. So uh, we'll go into more of those as I start doing some other industrial control uh, videos later on and start hooking up HMI devices and things like that. But anyway, all six of them have been detected. One of them is on the front panel, four of them are on the back panel, and one of them is not connected off the motherboard. Processors, this is the uh, i7 quad-core processor, the uh, mobile 3610 QE CPU running at 2.3 gigahertz nominally. And as you can see, it has eight, um, eight virtual cores or four physical cores with four hyper-threading cores. Um, in there as well. So uh, that's adds up to being quite a powerful um, PC and have the ability to do a lot of things. I've added an extra two gigs of RAM into this. It's not industrial strength RAM. So if I do get any issues with the PC once I put it out in the cold, I will remove the extra piece of RAM that I put in there and just leave it with the four gigs, which still should be fine. Um, sound and video is just a standard high definition audio, which has got those connections on the front panel. Uh, storage controllers, the only one that's really showing up here, in addition to the default ones up top here, um, is the uh, virtual clone drive, which I added. Uh, system devices, quite a range of devices in here. Um, obviously, the fans, and there are no fans connected, so these are really, they're there because the motherboard supports them but they're not used. Uh, thermal zones, uh, bus enumerators, direct DMA controllers, the audio controller, event timers, uh, chipset controllers, 
uh, management engine interfaces, it, this be, being an industrial PC, there is a few extra features in here that you may not find in normal desktop PCs, like the management engine, uh, which allows you to do um, serial communications to set up the uh, BIOS and stuff like that and configure the, the base hardware of the PC without actually having to be on the front panel. You can do it remotely. Um, Power management, virtual drive enumeration, that's with the uh, part of the Windows operating system. Uh, PCI, PCI bridges, programmable interrupt controllers, uh, real-time clock, and other um, bus enumerators. I don't actually see an spy bus controller or anything in here, but I do know that that there is a SPI memory chip as part of the controller. I think the BIOS itself is actually connected via a SPI bus. And then you've got your USB controllers, which is your USB 3. They're all USB 3. The USB 2 um, that is built in, which are also showing up here, are actually not connected. There's no um, headers connected to them and brought out to any panel. So they're internal and you potentially could connect something to them, um, but they're not brought out so you can't easily plug in a USB key or anything like that, not like a um, flash drive or anything. And that's fine. Having four USB 3 on the front panel, which also have backward compatibility to USB 2, is more than enough for the kind of PC and um, scenario that this is targeted at. So that's all the hardware that this is picked up on. Um, I actually did with Windows 7, you do have a performance um, index as well. So I actually ran that uh, just out of curiosity. So if I go into um, computer properties. So I ran it and it comes up with a score of 4.6 on the performance index. But that is not because of the computing power of this. So if I go in here, you can see... Um, the 4.6 is actually just because of the graphics and I haven't put a high performance hard drive in here This is just a physical hard drive as I say, it's a little two and a half inch Toshiba. I will try a um, Linux test on a future video where I have a 16 gigabyte Swiss bit industrial grade memory cards um, SATA based memory card that I'm going to plug in here to, to, to do the Linux test because Windows won't really go into 16 gigs easily but Linux will. But as you can see the processor and the RAM they're both way up almost maxed out as far as performance on the Windows 7 is concerned. So that's pretty good um, you know, I don't anticipate there's going to be any issues with running quite a few different applications in here. Uh, I don't know what else I can really show you right now that would be of any relevance. Everything else is going to be basically showing you what Windows 7 is, and that's not really what is of interest to anybody, I don't think. The whole purpose of this is to talk about industrial control and industrial PCs and everything. So I'm going to just keep this video short and leave it as just the Windows 7 Ultimate. And what I will be doing is... Um, over the next few days, I'm going to install up some uh, Mac 3 control software, uh, some Modbus, maybe even Node Red, and um, a few other things onto this machine so that I can then start integrating with some of my other industrial components and uh, see how well it performs. As I said, I'm going to uh, mount it out into the uh, workshop where my CNC is and that's unheated and we're in the middle of a Canadian winter right now so I'm already seeing uh, minus 12 to minus 15 degrees C outside and it's going to get colder. So I'm going to set this up with uh, wake on land capability and uh, let it get really, really cold outside and then start waking it up remotely and seeing how well it will wake up and perform. So we'll, you know, I'll, I'll wake it up. I'll have a quick look at how fast the, C, the processors are running, see if they're throttling back or not, or in increasing speed. I think based on the graphs that we looked at in the previous video, when we're down at the negative temperatures, uh, the processor actually starts getting a little bit faster with its speed step control. Um, when it starts approaching, uh, you know, the, the really high temperatures, which is what will happen when we go into the Canadian summer, um, then it will start stepping down in speed. So I look forward to seeing that as well. Uh, yeah, I think you've already seen between the previous video and this one, it takes nothing to set this up. It's a fully fledged PC, the same as you would get for your desktop and everything else. 
but with full industrial environmental extended capabilities. As I said in the previous video, minus 40 degrees centigrade to plus 85 uh, vibration and shock resistance. Uh, there's no fans. It's fully passive cooling out to large um, heat sinks, aluminum heat alloy heat sinks on either side of the uh, chassis for this. So, and, and they're using copper heat pipes to take the heat away from the main CPU and dissipate it out to those heat sinks. So it's not going to have any issues keeping cool. It's not going to have an issue of dragging in any um, environmental crap that might be in the air to contaminate the uh, capabilities of cooling or uh, the functionality of the board. Because there's no airflow internally, it's going to be just fine. It's probably going to stay clean for as long as I have this thing up and running. Um, that doesn't mean to say that when I'm running the CNC and things like that, the external might get covered in a bit of dust, uh, but that's to be expected in some, you know, some in industrial environment. So that we'll just look at that as it, as and when it may happen. Right. So that wraps up the video. I look forward to doing some more as I get software installed on here. And um, as I do, I will get them recorded and online for you to see those as well. It'll be interesting to see how well this performs. I'm not going to be able to stress it, I don't think, to the limits of what it is actually capable of, but I can certainly show you it working um, in really, really cold environments and later on, you know, into the plus 30s, 40s degrees when uh, the Canadian summer kicks in again because my um, workshop gets quite hot if I'm not running any fans or anything. So I'll deliberately leave it to get heated up when that, when that time comes. Anyway, that's it for now. So uh, see you again soon.